house. And as a result, anything that can be decorated, like the door and all the wooden slats, are very, very decorated. It's like flashing bright orange and blue and intricate design across it. So they decorate what they can, I guess, in contrast uh, to the environment, which is kind of cool. Um, uh, the people out in the Gobi are, are very fascinating, very, very hospitable. Um, this man just kind of stopped by and gave us a ride around on his horse. We were driving fast. Um, and the woman there is milking uh, the mares, presumably to make more air right. <laughs> <laughs> There's a girl selling eggs. Uh, the lady in the middle, the with the blue at the bottom, she was mining for gold. And uh, mm -hmm. Professor Minchin introduced us and kind of discussed what we were doing. Uh, not many people in the Gobi speak English, but this is kind of friendly camaraderie anyway. And she handed us a bowl with you know, sediment, and we were swirling around trying to find gold, not having luck. She just kind of shakes her head, reaches up, grabs it, flicks it a few times to the wrist, and hands it back, and there's gold like, around the flex and the edges. Huh. So it's something to eat to it, but she definitely had it down. And then uh, Hamras was the kind of patriarch of the family that kind of took us in the river in Gobi. Um, this is his wife and his motorcycle. Everybody gathered around. He's down in the well uh, checking the water uh, to see if we can drink from it. Uh, make sure everything's clear. I think he found a, a rusty shovel in there, so we moved to a different well. <laughs> uh, so again, uh, when we're at our site, if you're in the desert, your neighbors are sent to your lifeline, so you're going to be really friendly with them. But when we were there, uh, this little girl just like found us in the landscape a couple of days and brought us this huge kettle full of milk tea. And milk tea is like a sheep's milk, goat's milk, a little bit of black tea, and a lot of salt. And she brought it up and was kind of hung out and, and drank from it. Uh, didn't talk much, but we brought candy for her the next time, because she was pretty pleased. <laughs> And then later, uh, Professor Minkin introduced us to her family. We went down and visited. And the culture says that if the door is open, you can just walk in. And if they have, they'll give you candy, cheese, uh, tea for certain. If there's soup, they'll bring it. And if you're really lucky, they will have just slaughtered uh, one of their goats or their sheep. And they'll bring you a bowl of the guts full of it. And so Maddie and I were the first to be introduced uh, to this custom. It was me and her and then Professor Minkin and one of the Hawaiian students in the house. And Bimba, our driver, who was, seated, who was seated right there, he sits down with it with this giant knife and starts cutting into it and handing us pieces back. Of course, like, what is this? And mentions his pointing, you know, whichever we're going to do. We can't turn it down or hide it, so we ended up eating it. It wasn't that bad. We <coughs> were also pretty hungry. So. <laughs> But she lost her camera one day, and uh, the people like, who lived around there were herding their goats through and found it. And so they put it in a plastic bag to protect it from the rain and threw in some cheese for good measure. Really, really friendly, I think. And it works both ways. We stopped in, we saw them, and then one morning we saw this fantastic motorcycle parked outside uh, of our care. And uh, this man was another. Uh, he came by for breakfast one day and he had his motorcycle. He was really pleased to see us all crowded around it, admiring it. It's got tassels, uh, lights, Hello Kitty carpet seats. I <laughs> 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 found out a peace siren is mounted on the front too, which he used to herd his horses through our camp. <laughs> <laughs> and he also gave us rides around this morning. Our comrades uh, through the family took us in. I introduced us to uh, a neighbor a few miles away who was having a wedding. And so we were invited as guests. And we really were treated as extended family almost. Um, nobody spoke English, but we were almost kind of there and, and greeted. And uh, there was 50 people in the gear, stacked three deep. And uh, this man in the blue is the bartender. And there was passing around food and drink and all kinds of stuff. And there really isn't much of a formal ceremony. This is kind of like a big party that says, hey, we're together now. <laughs> yeah, and uh, this is the bride and groom dressed in the traditional blue. Uh, there may not be much of a ceremony, but there is uh, certain traditions. Uh, that morning we scrambled around camp to find something worthy as kind of a gift to bring. And then later we found out that it's customary to sing uh, to the bride and groom. So 
So all the Mongolians sang a few uh, of their uh, traditional songs, and they all looked at us. <laughs> but fortunately, Paul Meyer is a proficient musician, so he sang a few songs. And then Nick, at the top, uh, played some stuff on his harmonica, and then he gave the harmonica to the um, and after the wedding, a breakout spilled out, and they found out we had cameras. And they're no stranger to technology, and they've got I do this and I do all this stuff, but they still love to have their picture taken. So as soon as we had our cameras out, they started grabbing each other and posing. So we're taking pictures. And eventually they started like pulling us into pictures and posing. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was a then after the wedding, we went uh, to Hamarx's uh, Gare. Uh, he's got one of the fancy ones. He's got his own tractor and a, a satellite dish, and a very, very scruffy dog. Um, and we had a bonfire, which in Mongolia, a bonfire isn't so much by our standards because there's no fuel at all. But it's, it's like burning dried uh, goat dung and roots. But we had a nice fire going, and uh, we took like a, a modified gas tank and made it into a pressure cooker. And they took rocks and burnt the rocks and put them in the fire. And took the rocks, put it in the can with some water to boil, and threw uh, freshly butchered goat in with it. And just threw the whole thing on fire and let it cook. That was actually pretty good. It was very tough to eat, but much better than the, the intestine. <laughs> <laughs> and these are just a couple of those kids that were picking in us as we were eating. And as we were leaving, we stopped at what was, what was considered, I guess, in Genghis uh, Khan's time, to be the uh, capital of the world. Uh, now it's converted to like a Buddhist uh, monastery. And it's like the blue ribbons everywhere, uh, prayer wheels, uh, and very, very fancy temples and stuff. You don't want to <coughs> of the revision at our site at Chartreuse. And basically we measured about 340 meters of section. Uh, and we had to compare it with uh, Cincinnati strata to probably distinguish between uh, different forces in uh, sea level change, tectonic versus uh, eustatic change. Um, just for a bit of context, uh, Mongolia is right here. Hmm during the revision. And if you look at the tectonic map, it's particularly telling. Uh, it's a complete a conglomeration of different terrains that were accreted uh, throughout the history. It's very, very tectonically modified. Um, and of course, India came and smashed into it uh, later on and made it very structurally complex. So it's important to keep in mind when making comparisons to also include uh, possibly for tectonic effects, especially in the case. All right, so some of you uh, are very familiar with sequence geography and all its details, and others understand that's much. So, when we of sequence geography, we mean uh, at its most basic. It's a way of investigating and identifying changes in sea level as recorded in the rock record. Um, and these changes can be instigated by uh, global eustatic change or by localized tectonic effects. And uh, the uh, global changes are cyclic on several scales. So, for example, uh, the way over the other side of the cup, the dispenser, maybe. Yeah. Okay, so you've got sea level rise and fall on a large scale over a long period of time. If you look really, really closely at it, you see this is in fact made up of uh, smaller scales. Um, and even looking closer at that, you see even the smaller scales. Uh, so, looking for the sequences is a way to distinguish uh, any. So if you're comparing uh, the Cincinnati section with the Mongolian section, uh, not only is general topologic patterns a good uh, way to tell if it's eustatic or not, it's a basis, but if they're marrying each other, it's likely to be a eustatic effect. Um, but finding the sequences also is a good point, uh, which we need to it is. So in order to compare this section, we need to find a point of correlation, or a point of water. Flow. So in our section, uh, Professor Mujin had identified a major sequence boundary between the uh, Kyrgyzian and Ashdoing stages of the Ordovician. Uh, 
this, uh, this one here. And then uh, Steve Holland and others determined, found the same uh, boundary of this is not defined between the uh, the R9 and the range of the generations. Um, and then starting here, as a point of work, you kind of make general with the logic comparisons. Uh, it's more shaly, more to the um, back, and a bit more uh, limestone after that. And so there is uh, some with logic comparison between the two. But again, we need to look for these cycles to be sure whether this is static or tectonic and whatnot. Um, to that, we use thin 